so today's call is uh, for uh, the MCC team uh, to give us an update uh, for those, especially for those of us who hadn't uh, joined the uh, Tuesday call. Um, so MCC team, uh, you are in the driver's seat, uh, so uh, um, you can get started anytime you think that uh, you have sufficient uh, cloud uh, to get started, uh, although we are missing uh, um, Laura at the moment, but she shouldn't uh, be too long. She would be joining us momentarily. So over to you guys uh, to decide when you want to start. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Karen, are you uh, wanting to move the slides or do you want uh, uh, us to, to do it? Uh, yeah, are, are we ready to start or no. should we wait for Laura? No, we'll go ahead and start. Okay, all right. Uh, so here's our agenda for today. I'll just give a quick um, progress update because the last time uh, we met on this was at the beginning of December, so it's been two months. Um, and then Gay will talk a little bit about the IG redesign. Emma will give an update on the long COVID domain uh, data element identification process. Uh, we'll talk through some connectathon items, and then we have some updated proposed timing for the balloting, uh, which will also require a PSS update, and then just have some time for questions and discussion. So most of you know this already, but we have three key deliverables. So the first around the data elements identification, the value sets, uh, fire mappings, et cetera. The second is around the care, um, care plan application. So these are smart on fire applications uh, with that can be used by patients, clinicians, and caregivers um, for the EHR. Uh, yeah, for, for uh, the data, sorry, my brain is like, it's 5 p.m. Uh, okay, and then the third item is the uh, fire implementation guide. So on the right, uh, these are all domains you're familiar with. The, the newest domain here is the long-term COVID conditions domain. And this is our, so the project is in year three. Um, and so this is the roadmap that we have for the year three. Uh, the two, um, in the two colors of activities in the green is mostly related to the data elements, value sets work. And then the blue is for the apps and IG work. Uh, so we uh, are currently in February and we just had a federal partners meeting um, earlier this week and right now we'll give, I'll give a quick update on the apps, um, but then Gay and Emma will be able to dive uh, more deeply into the IG and the um, value sets. And we will plan uh, to have Dave Carlson, our solutions architect, um, share on an upcoming meeting uh, in more depth what the um, apps are, uh, the status around that. So if you have further questions, we will be happy to take them, but um, we do plan to have some additional time carved out to discuss those. So in terms of the apps update, uh, current, this is for work accomplished in year three. So we uh, did a evaluation of the inherited interoperability infrastructure and app design. Um, and then, so, what we inherited was a provider app and a patient app. And so we took a look at the code for that and uh, looked at its current state. And then we also are working on developing an infrastructure architecture strawman. So we won't address that on today's call, but uh, we'll be back with more details. Uh, we've built out a prototype for the version 2.0 for the caregiver and patient app. Um, originally, the intention was to have those apps be separate, but upon reviewing the needs and requirements for the patient caregiver, we have decided um, to go along the design path to um, keep uh, uh, move forward with it as uh, one singular app um, in its second build. 
And then we've also set up some sandbox environment for testing and demonstrating purposes. And then we've also um, set up a, um, a working relationship with the RTI OHSU team who are doing pilot testing. And I believe um, Sarah from that team is on today's call. A quick update on the provider app application. So we are current, we've received some initial feedback from OHSU providers via RTI, and we are going through um, ongoing conversations uh, to uh, turn those, turn that feedback into product stories. So we are currently incorporating that initial feedback and using it to inter an iterative process improve um, some user experience improvements. And that's just a screenshot there. So more to come on that. And then here is the prototype of the patient caregiver app uh, version two. So again, as mentioned, we decided to go with one common app that will have just some additional behavior um, features depending on the role, whether you're the patient or the caregiver. Um, a key thing about this, uh, version two build is that there isn't a, a dependency on any application server middleware. Um, so it can communicate directly with any fire endpoint. So I think the, the key benefit of this design is that it can also be quickly configured to be pilot tested with any patient or caregiver uh, if they have the provider, but using a health system um, that has a patient uh, portal. Uh, so. Uh, that includes Epic, Cerner, Oscrips, VA, and others. And so what's next right now is to, we're working on building in uh, functionality. So that basically uses value sets to filter and sort uh, to present data like labs. Um, we're currently working on authoring patient goals um, and where that data sits, because if it's not available in current uh, institutional EHR systems, and then we're also working on some MVP features for, for the caregiver um, perspective. Uh, so I will pause there. That was just a very high level run through of where we are with the apps. Again, um, we will plan for more time to discuss this in more depth, but I just wanted to give that update to this group. Any questions that I can um, take? Uh, let me check the chat. Okay, thanks, Emma. So I just wanted to, before we move to the next step, Karen, just to let folks know that there's a copy of the issue plus having antitrust policy in chat. I didn't want to read it out to everybody, but apparently we're supposed to make reference to it or mention it, to it, mention it during every call. So please read it at your leisure. Sorry, Karen, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Emma. I was just asking if anyone had any questions for the high level, where we are, um, or anything related to the apps. Uh, just this is Stephen. Just a quick one uh, about the apps for the sure. patient-facing apps. Is that just a uh, view-only app, or does the app allow patients to enter uh, care plan-related data? So the goal is to be uh, to enable some authoring through the patient app. Nothing related to authoring into EHR systems. So, um, but we're uh, discussing some like supplemental data stores or maybe another um, server behind firewalls that can hold that data that isn't currently able to be held in an EHR system. So we're focusing on authoring patient goals um, as a near term right back capability. Right, um, thank you. I think the reason why I'm asking that yeah, that is, uh, uh, there are two folks. Number one, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of patient empowerment. So uh, it sort of uh, gives the patient the voice or the ability to express sort of uh, what they want or yeah. they don't want. And so therefore a way of uh, addressing barriers to care. And uh, number two, I think clinicians uh, who are caring the patient 
uh, should read uh, sort of uh, what patients uh, um, posted uh, sort of on uh, their care plan apps and so therefore take into con these considerations uh, where uh, they um, make decisions about uh, the planning of the care of the patient as a matter of a joint decision making process. Uh, yes. So so that's sort of uh, the basis of the question and I think it's important to consider that. Yes, definitely. That's very much top of mind. And um, Stephen, you'll see in our connect connectathon plans, um, we do have discussions around that. Um, but the whole intention, and again, I didn't um, surface the infrastructure architecture slides, but we do plan to have that supplemental data store for this express purpose of having patients author goals and then being able to surface that information with everybody on the patient's care team. Thank you. And I know that there are a lot more deeper uh, sort of uh, issues to uh, discuss yes. uh, and expose, but I think yes, um, the essence is to sort of have this on the agenda. Thank you for uh, your response. Yeah. Okay. So I will hand it over to Gay. Okay, doc. Um, I think a couple of you were on the call yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, um, where we started to talk about this. And I honestly can't remember if we brought the, I feel like we brought this topic up once before on the call in the last call about how we were looking towards um, uh, <clears throat> changing the approach uh, that in within the implementation guide where we have um, been binding each, uh, e each data element and associating it with the value set and then creating a profile for that. So, um, you know, uh, creating a, a profile for each, uh, clinical concept really. And, um, <clears throat> as you know, more and more data elements have been defined over the past year or so, we realized we're going to be contributing to the disease of profile proliferation. And so we thought we should um, look at a new approach. And so, and other, uh, other some other implementation guides have done this um, where we've, uh, where they create a library of value sets. And, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about what I mean with that and maybe show the implementation guide depending on how time goes. I mean, we haven't changed it, but we can see what we're going to change it from. Um, we've recognized we needed to add some uh, additional guidance, um, particularly with how uh, related standards are going to be um, referred to. Uh, we're, we're, it's really beyond the scope of creating, say, um, you know, additional profiles of those of, of those particular standards that relate closely, um, but uh, we, we we realized we needed to have some more guidance with respect to that. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> we we're all we're using the um, the base and the the, the, the uh, foundational uh, re resource in the implementation guide is the uh, a um, an MC a, a care plan profile profiling of the care plan resource, directly on the care plan resource, not currently using US Core as our asserted goal is, given, this is, given that this is a US ROM um, uh, implementation guide, <clears throat> but uh, we have a specific reason we are not using that. And I, we'll have to revisit the fact whether we have requested an exemption or that or, uh, on that or not. But, um, uh, the reason why we're not is because it's, the, the U.S. core care plan is very much limited to um, a text type of care plan and, and, and not necessarily encouraging or even requiring uh, structured data. So um, I know that there's some, some uh, vendors that, in fact, are you know, interested in changing that as well. So potentially that may, may change over time where we would then refer to and, and constrain the US core care plan should that uh, uh, structure be removed. Um, and so, okay, uh, next slide. So um, what we have done, we have two approaches now. We have one approach in the current implementation guide. And that is where we take each, um, as I mentioned before, for every, Clinical concept where we have an, uh, that that is that's determined needing a value set to represent a clinical concept. 
while we've been creating a profile for each one of those. And in some instances, we will still be doing that. For example, there's um, uh, some main, main type of um, uh, profiles that we'll have to create. So we've got one, the one we have in the uh, implementation guide that we'll, we'll keep that way is the chronic kidney disease profile because that brings in and refers to several other and, and many other uh, profiles to kind of bring it all together. Um, so we will have that approach for this one or probably diabetes, potentially a pain. Um, not sure yet exactly how that's gonna be constructed, but we anticipate ha having the same approach in some instances. However, approach number two, next slide, um, will be that we are instead going to create a set of um, maybe four to six multiple chronic condition or multiple chronic uh, condition, not condition, multiple chronic care, care plans, uh, profiles that are for several different um, domains. So one for condition, one for intervention, one for goal. And then from those, we will point to a library of value sets that will then say, hey, this is this, these set of value sets you can use um, in this particular MCC profile. Uh, and so we'd have a library of value sets rather than um, a bunch, creating a bunch of uh, many, many, many profiles. <clears throat> uh, next. So um, yeah, that's basically, I already said this. And then we, the, the, these implementation guides are the, prof, are the uh, projects that we will be examining how we should more fully explain how they relate to one another and or can be used, but won't be building anything into the implementation guide necessarily is um, particularly around uh, plan definition, clinical guidelines and uh, clinical quality language. Um, next. So just to sort of emphasize why we're doing the pointing to value set thing is that there, uh, in the in years one and two, there was over, around 1100 data elements that were identified um, and having value sets and a percentage of those will would have been profiled into 600 or more new profiles. And so we just thought that was not the appropriate way to go about things. Uh, next. And this is a, to give you a picture of what I mean by creating baseline MCC profiles. Uh, the condition profile, for example, has those four attributes slash elements that um, are constrained above and beyond what the US score condition profile constrains, uh, the same for each one of these particular uh, domains or profiles. And um, these are not the only ones, but this is just, you know, four ones that I just wanted to use as an example. And so the implementation guide will ultimately contain a page with lists of uh, value sets that are, that will be, the, either are, many of them are already in, um, in VSAC. Uh, we currently are, and, and they're also, you know, can be achieved, uh, reached through the implementation guide, the ones that were done in the first year. And uh, we're currently queuing and reviewing the, um, the ones that were developed in the, in the second year and, and determining just exactly which um, of the, these uh, base core profiles that uh, they will be used for. Uh, and the other, the other advantage of doing this library as opposed to just the binding, we'll have explanatory text on, um, on how to use the value sets. Um, and it, they will all also not only can be used for re retrieving and uh, the patient data to represent in the profile, but potentially if a, a, a snapshot, if you will, a, a bundle of the data elements were sent out of the care plan, the MCC care plan, why we could, they could be used for validation. In addition to that, the value sets can be used uh, in the applications and the apps to for sorting, sorting and filtering, filtering and whatnot. Next page. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, I think many of you know uh, the US core uh, implementation guide has a timeline that will be reiterated every year. And uh, in, in response to uh, US CDI versions and updates, 
uh, and in addition to plus uh, new industry requirements, other industry requirements that may have come in primarily through errata and comment processes. Um, and because of that, we will need to review annually the profiles that we have created to determine whether the profiles are still needed or if additional uh, constraints are required or if some constraints need to be taken away. Um, and so that, so I, this is just, I wanted to, so people have this at hand. This is also uh, in the US core implementation guide. Uh, next. That's it for your section, Gay. Okay, um, so I know I kind of brushed off questions yesterday for those of you who are on the call. So uh, does anyone have any questions or concerns about um, this new approach? And, you know, we have not yet uh, taken this on in the implementation guide, but, and so as we do, if we do, uh, if there's no objections, why uh, we will show the changes as they occur. Yeah, uh, Shelly, oh, sorry, it looks like Shelly has a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Um, a comment and, and question. Um, you know, for the last five years, the pharmacist electronic care plan, you know, it's pretty mature. You've got millions of care plans that are being generated, fire based with value sets uh, a part of that. And I'm, I'm kind of concerned about breaking out into interventions, health concerns, interventions, goals, and outcomes. We incorporated into the value sets those terms of intervention, goals, outcomes into the value set, but kept the, the profile of the implementation guide specific to the entire process. So we've already proven proof of concept that that works. I, this is the first I've heard of breaking them out into different profiles. So I, was, I was just wanted to know no, how I, I don't understand what okay. you're doing. I don't really understand your question. Well, so, I, uh, are you, you saying you didn't actually create uh, like a condition profile or procedure profiles or goal profiles or labs or? Correct, procedure. correct. There, it's one pharmacist electronic care plan profile. And what we did with the value sets and driving the standardization, we're naming the value sets that fit into those different sections. And it sounds like kind of like the same thing we're talking about, but we're, um, you know, there are attributes and elements that this project particularly is looking for to be seen within the profile. So I think I'd have to look more closely at the fire um, care plan. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the pharmacy fire care plan. Is that the pharmacist? The, it's the pharmacist care plan implementation guide fire release for. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I know I'm, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't dug into it. Uh, in detail, and I'm, you know, I'm not really. And, and what we did was we actually bound groups of value sets to the profile. Right, right. So that's how you'll see it right now. But if we did that right now, we would. So you you bound it to. So you created like many many profiles or many profiles for probably not as many in this instance as in this instance. So, so you one, created one many. Sorry? One, one profile. One profile. Pharmacist electronic care plan. Oh, but see, there's the, the care plan has to refer to other profiles that are used in the care plan. The care plan is just a, um, you know, it's kind of a framework. And that's the concept that I'm having a hard time with. But, you know, we could talk offline, Gay. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get wrap my head around different profiles and how it would affect you know, this very mature pharmacist electronic care plan if changes are being made for, for this. Okay. Uh, Shelly, perhaps this is a good segue for me uh, to mention that Jay has set up uh, a conference page uh, under the patient care care plan uh, project, which would uh, allow uh, different uh, stakeholders to put in their functional needs. And one of uh, the area that we had identified at the last week's conference call uh, was the pharmacy's uh, care plan. So maybe you, uh, there are two things that uh, we can uh, consider or we can action on. Uh, number one is you take a look at that conference page, which I will show uh, towards the end of uh, the call. 
uh, to uh, sort of uh, provide your input in there. And number two, uh, at uh, one of uh, the Kaplan Dem 2.0 uh, conference calls uh, um, in the following weeks, uh, when you are available and have time, uh, we probably would like to have a deeper dive into what you have done. So therefore, it gets, gives us a better understanding and so therefore uh, harmonize sort of what you have done uh, into uh, the work uh, that we plan to do going forward. And, and we um, are, are not, just to clarify, we're not changing the care plan resource. We are um, constraining the care plan resource to meet the needs of the, of, uh, the multiple chronic condition uh, scenario, just like you, your team uh, constrained the, uh, the fire care plan resource to meet the needs for the pharmacy world. So it's the same, it's the same paradigm, not changing the underlying resource. When I mentioned changing something, it was the US core care plan, which um, you know, focuses on just having a text. Um, and so I just wanted to, to clarify that. I think we're, you know, I think it's a matter of um, taking a, a closer look at the implement to the implementation guides and um, understanding um, to understand what your concerns are. Okay, I, I, again, my biggest concern is making changes to something that's already has a maturity level and it, it, I don't know how it will affect it is what I'm saying. So we're not changing anything that already has a maturity level. Okay. Okay. It, it sounds, um, Shelly, like, yeah, the, 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 thanks Stephen for offering to show the page that that'll be great. But that's about requirements, about what we want to make sure that the care plan dam covers and supports, not about the patterns we use, the design patterns to 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 do that support. So that, that'll be interesting as well. Yeah, can't wait to see it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for always appreciate your insight. You guys have had that out for a while. Out and highly used. Yeah, but this is Emma, you know, and I'm clicking through it, looking for the care plan resource. I think you're using other resources though. I see condition, I see procedure. Yeah, I popped a link to the guide in the chat if anyone wants to look at it. It does, it does have profiles on other. It's on, not, I don't see any care plan resource yet. There's a you know, care plan client, maybe that's what they're talking about. And that's the actor, no, that's the art of the behavior. There's an example, yeah. I see just there's, Care coordination, coverage, medication dispense, composition, service request, instruction, procedures, encounter, medication. Yeah, so I'm actually not seeing any care oh, plan. Yeah, that, that uses, yeah, that one had, I think uses the care plan type. Which one? The, the one that's the composition. So you know what, you know, Shelly, I think one of the big differences here is that um, I, I, and this makes sense since you guys were, you know, sort of did the, the care plan, uh, CD, CCDA, so CDA care plan, I, um, yeah. and also, so I think the, the, the biggest difference is that you'll be communicating things in it. It's like an instance, like the, like CDA, the CDA care plan is an instance in time of a care plan. Yeah. And, and then you're sending the information from, you know, the care plan from one place to another place in a bundle. Right. That is a composition. So this is um, using the fire care plan resource with the intention that it's a dynamic care plan and there's ongoing interactions and it's like kind of a central hub. So it is a little different of a use case. I got it. Okay. Care plan document. Always yeah. helps to look at what, what people are talking about from my perspective. No, I totally yeah. understand. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, it's a care plan document. What would be interesting is how it's different from document reference, you know, with US Core. That would be the interesting thing. Yeah, I, I might agree with that. I don't think that we have spent um, um, any time uh, um, examining or uh, reviewing the uh, pharmacy's care plan and the approaches that they take and uh, how it differs uh, from uh, the dynamic care plan concept that we're working on. I think that's sort of a way uh, past overdue time that we uh, uh, liaise with uh, uh, Sherry and also Scott Robinson's from the pharmacy uh, uh, work group uh, to uh, take a look into that. Uh, so therefore we can look at sort of uh, how to uh, um, take 
on board uh, their requirements and uh, looking at the differences and uh, the uh, harmonization pathway forward. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Any other questions for Gay? Uh, I do have one, but I think we'll take it uh, sort of uh, at the next call. I just don't want to hold up uh, too much of the time. Uh, the, the just preempt uh, about it is about clinical queries into the care plan, but we'll take that as it's a complex discussion. We'll take that uh, sort of uh, um, uh, take it up next time. Yeah, especially when Dave's on. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Yesterday, my brain was uh, not firing at all in all uh, with all cylinders. I, uh, Emma know that it was too a bit early for me. Yeah. But uh, sort of, yeah. I've woken up today. But uh, we'll take it uh, at other time when uh, Dave comes on board uh, with the call. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so it's my turn. I can't. Um... Um, yes, it is. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm again, I have been working on our long COVID symptom domain, which is one of the domains um, of the multiple chronic condition um, care planning work. And so we're right now at the stage where we're gathering the data elements for the symptoms, um, which include assessment tools, you know, long COVID symptoms. Um, and, um, and, and it falls into the, to the, into the same care planning paradigm that we've been following, you know, the health concerns, um, references, you, you set your goals, do your interventions, evaluate, see if you, your goals are being met, and then start assessing again. So this is um, work that we recently started. <clears throat> and what we um, will plan on going through the same process of gathering the symptoms data element and then next we'll start looking at long COVID related testing and observations and in sometimes in, in some of the work we talk about the orderables and performables or the orders and you know things that and the results. And then from that we will move on to long COVID related social issues, so social determinants of health. And you know, people tend to ask what is if there's any, you know, lots of people get long COVID, become you know, lose their job or become homeless, you know, have some caretaking issues. Those, those are the kinds of things that we will be trying to discover and to make sure that that information is shareable. And then from there, we'll move on to our long COVID diagnosis. So that's the process we're following right now. Well, we're in the process of collecting the information for the symptoms. So if Karen, can you move to the next slide? And we actually have a, um, Google Sheet where our subject matter experts or tap can contribute and add, you know, provide the information that they usually document or what they come across during their day-to-day -day -day lives or their, you know, as they care for patients or caregivers and patients as well as part of our tap, some of the um, you know, symptoms or things that they experience or they come into contact with or that the loved ones are experiencing. We're also, um, like I said, during this process, looking at screening tools, assessment tools, and you know, those kinds of things that are usually used with um, you know, working with symptoms. Um, we have, we will be approaching, you know, tap in because we need, we probably need to be able to explain, I'm mean, sorry, to share attributes of symptoms such as the duration and you know and anatomical locations and those kinds of things that may be um, some of the other additional data elements that we will also have to include. Um, and you know we're asking questions like something like a rash for example, how detailed do we need the rash to be? You know you can have multiple from work with dermatologists, there can be multiple different types of rashes, you know, those kinds of things. So those are the kinds of questions that we have for you know, our tech members right now. Um, and we have a link to the spreadsheet of where we're doing our analysis work and collecting the data pieces that's on the, in the um, presentation right now. So you can definitely you know, access and take a look around that. <clears throat> 
and Karen has put it in chat. <laughs> right. Um, any, any questions for me? Hey, Emma, Laura, what do the asterisk mean? Oh, those are associated, that we have associated um, assessment scales for those. So that's why I have, we have to ask oh, next okay. to those, you know, like most symptoms have assessment mm -hmm. skills uh, with them. And we try to put like the references to the assessment skills, the ones we can find, as well as who submitted them. <clears throat> um, okay. And if there are more, you know, I, um, this past weekend I was reading about this and I think CDC has a bunch of assessment skills out there as well. And we'll also be taking a look at those. And actually, I can put that in chat. The, the thing, the thing from CDC. Any? So, just one thing when it comes to long COVID symptoms, because it's such a dynamically changing, figuring it out as time goes on. Um, I think it'd be just be important not only to have this list, but to, how do you identify something that somebody is saying? Well, this is my symptom that is a long COVID symptom. I never had this before COVID. Now I have it. It's not going away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things we've talked about doing. <clears throat> that, that's yeah, definitely important. One of the things that we've talked about doing is having one. Uh, you know, we haven't sure decided how to approach it. You know, to have um, this. You know, like a, a lo very a loosely bound value set, if you will, or actually have something mm -hmm. that is. You know, here's. You know, the obvious. It's going to be no more bound than extensible anyway, but. Um, uh, you know, potentially we might want to have another uh, profile that says, you know, other symptoms, uh, you know, of concern or something like that and have it just wide open uh, so that, uh, yeah, you, you know, so that we, we don't miss things like that. I mean, I think it's so, to the point of being able to query it. I mean, if this is implemented, we're using it and then people say, well, I don't have anything on this list, but I have this item. Mm -hmm. And then we want to be able to say, well, here's another item that somewhere in the field they're associating as a long COVID. I mean, the patient themselves, other caregivers might be saying, well, this seems to be a long COVID symptom for you. And so just being able to identify it. So the querying part will find it. Yeah. yeah. So that was one of the reasons why I actually did a um, Jira, well, to fire eye about the use of category. Like how in you know how can we use category on element on fire to be able to do those kinds of things? Speaking about query, um, can we make categories that specific so you can associate all of these things if you think they're belonging, they relate, they are long COVID, you know that kind of thing. That I was some. Well, and I, I mean, uh, from a query, I, I hesitate because I'm thinking as you guys have thought about it longer, but it's like. Does it have to be that this is a set of identified symptoms that are considered long COVID as much as these are symptoms and we want to put an identifier on it to say this is somebody's calling it a long COVID symptom? I mean, it's that twister thing. Do you see what I'm trying to say? I mean, maybe you don't have a list of symptoms. You have a way to say these are my symptoms and I want to flag it as a long COVID thing. I think that's a really interesting point, Laura. Um, mm -hmm. and, and maybe it's a both and, um, because I think, maybe. you know, I think this is something that we've struggled with for sure, right? Where there's there's a bunch of stuff that I think we're, we're fairly confident in our long COVID. And then there's a bunch of stuff that, um, you know, are just out there as potentially things that need to be explored further. And I think where part of our aims are research related, I think it's important to include those things that aren't, you know, concretely linked mm -hmm. as yet, because I think, you know, for, for the research use cases, it's, it's important to kind of have some of those things that might end up not being associated with long COVID, but right now are, are worth exploring. Um, mm -hmm. But you're right, that list is going to change and grow and evolve. So so what so just taking a step back, one of the ways that we we are trying to address those things too is by engaging uh, Survivor Corps, which is a large um, organization of, of people who are experiencing long COVID and, and they do a lot of like aggregation of what their community is reporting up and trying mm -hmm. to kind of 
put a finger on things that they're hearing from lots of people. Um, you know, as opposed to just like one person saying, hey, this is this is long COVID or this is happening to me. Could this be long COVID? They're trying to kind of aggregate some of the stuff they're seeing sort of across their network. So, yeah. you know, we we are trying to get that sort of list from them um, to potentially expand this list. Um, but I do like the idea of what you're saying, right, as, as a way to potentially tag something as, you know, is, is sort of like potentially associated with COVID, because I think that would have, you know, both care and research applications. Um, yeah. So I think that's something to consider how we would, how we would do that exactly. But I like the idea, because you know, where this is such a shifting target that would provide a lot of flexibility. Yeah, and I think, I think we need to, because, I mean, even long COVID itself, what exactly do we think that is? I mean, we don't know, right? Because we're still in it. And so we don't know what long COVID means. Does long COVID mean that it's something you have for an extended period, but it actually then gets better and goes away? Or does long COVID mean that you have a morbidity that lasts the rest of your life? I mean, yeah, we don't, we don't really know. know and we fear is. the latter, which is, which is kind of why we, yeah. <laughs> put, why we combined this with our multiple chronic conditions. Um, project because mm -hmm. we think that there there may be people who have new chronic conditions either as a result of COVID um, and long COVID or who may um, you know or may, maybe there be exacerbation of existing chronic conditions as a result too. So, I, right. I yeah. mean, we don't a know lot that of COVID is a disease that you get you know the the smell or the the loss of smell or loss of taste and it lasts two years and then two years from now everybody suddenly starts getting better. I mean, we right. have no idea it's, yet. It's so soon. A lot of unanswered <laughs> questions. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's why I just kind of like, you know, I, I encourage this to be in a way that you can let that evolve and, and it can contribute to that exploration and finding it in the querying part. Any other oh, questions? Sorry, I didn't. No, go ahead. You know, when you start the first, usually I just start to figure, you know, I try to think in my mind, how will this be represented in fire? That's my, mm -hmm. my next level, you know, when when we, we, when we figure out whether how to tag it or however way we're going to do it, how will we be able to, to be able to query it? So and those are the kinds of things that I... To that point, Emma, I don't know that it has all the answers, but I would, I... The other day when you guys were kind of mentioning this, I sent a quick note to Nathan Davis and just asked him if he had done any work around this in the COVID-19 IG that he did with Logica. And uh -huh. he didn't say, he said, no, we haven't really done a lot with long COVID, but the signs and symptoms profile that they did should handle some of what's looking at that. So I'm not saying that that's it, but I'm just saying you might want to look at it. And yeah, we have looked at it. They um, look at it. Yeah, we have looked at it, but oh, okay, good. Say, I mean, not the word we just, you know, haven't decided how we're going to relate the two or use the two or refer from one to the other yet. Sure. But we yeah. have decided, I mean, there was some, you know, tentative potential work that was going to be looking at everything surrounding and we say, no, <laughs> it's already done. We, yeah. We're focusing on the long, you know, the details, I guess, of long COVID for this aspect and referring to the... <clears throat> The library, they did a library of value sets too. Yeah. Is there a definition out there right now that constitutes long COVID? Yes, yeah, Laura, I think there is some <laughs> definitions out there. There are several definitions. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like you said, is it's it, Is it time based? Like if you have it more than a certain amount of time, then you can consider it long COVID? Is that? Yep. And a certain amount of time varies by definition, by the different definitions. Yeah. And also is um, tied to the underlying pathology, uh, sort of uh, as to whether or not uh, the pathological changes re uh, results in some uh, sort of a uh, short term reversible or uh, uh, sort of longer term uh, irreversible uh, problems. I mean, at yesterday's call, there was a discussion about uh, um, long COVID and I. Uh, um, diabetes or type 1 diabetes, right? and we know that right, um, 
one of the pathological mechanisms is uh, the coronavirus itself, uh, sort of latched on to ACE2 uh, sort of a receptors of the cells. And any uh, sort of a body mm -hmm. structures or tissues that has abundance of that kind of uh, receptors uh, would uh, be uh, the target of attack. And so therefore has some short term or longer term consequences. And the pancreas is uh, one of them. And so therefore, uh, there is a, a sort of a uh, correlational type of or causality type of relationship uh, between uh, the virus and the uh, sort of uh, organ damage. So, uh, so that so it is kind of uh, related both on a uh, time base and also a, a histopathological uh, sort of uh, um, basis uh, of uh, the disease mechanisms that constitute the long COVID, uh, and so therefore. There are some definitions out there. Uh, the question is, how do we then sort of uh, work on uh, uh, using those uh, definitions and also uh, uh, the histopathological changes uh, to uh, uh, um, to represent uh, those uh, long COVID uh, situations? Okay, I'm sorry. I think I took us down a rabbit hole. My apologies to the group. No, I think it's an interesting uh, sort of a discussion. So uh, it's always good to uh, sort of have questions like this. The next slide. Um, so is this my slide, Karen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's part of. <laughs> As part of the connected this past January, when we did um, through connected on um, January connected on twenty nine, one of the things that came up as you know because we were trying to demonstrate, we we did a lot of work around discussing around goals, patient goals, and provider goals, and then we um, identified that goals that addresses was not a search search parameter, so we added that. You know, added a Jerry and has been added is in R5 now. So you can be able to query for like the conditions or observations that the goal was, you know, addressed. Um, another thing that we talked a lot about was that dealing with barriers and also protective factor when it comes to fire. Like if, if fire had a constructive or way in which you, you know, people can document barriers in their system or document protective factors and have a way to be able to query for all the things that may be barriers to, you know, patient achieving their goals and other things. So that was why it was, it was identified that it isn't only goals that people can have barriers to, you know, patients can, you know, have barriers to being able to, unable to obtain their medications or where they do not want to do a certain procedure because of some barrier. Maybe they don't have a, you know, caregiver at home or something like that. And so the idea now, or the suggestion is possibly moving forward and find a common way in which we can be able to capture that, capture and share barriers and protective factors in fire in a way where it is queryable, which means not use an extension. And so um, we're hoping to, well, the next step I think would be to approach FireEye and for us to come up with a doable suggestion or how to do this. One suggestion was to use observation.focus where you can use the observation to capture the goal and the focus can reference the thing, you know, the thing that the barrier is associated with. So focus is a reference, I believe right now to any you know, observation-based fire. And this is where um, we probably, go back to OO, see if that's the intent of the resource. Um, you know, so these are some of the things, oh, should we need, do we need to use risk assessment resource? You know, that kind of, so those are some of the conversations that we need to have um, as far as barriers and protective factor. Um, another th discussion was about prioritizing goal and, you know, is there a clean way or way in which we can do goal prioritization in context of, you know, is this a priority for the patient? Is it a priority for the caregiver? Whose priority is it? Um, the specialist or the primary care provider, or, you know, the care team, that kind of thing. 
So that's another thing, piece of work that we need to start to take a look at and figure out how to be able to implement that in fire. Um, yes, yeah, so next step, we added a JIRA and it got approved by patient care. So go at that addresses. It's a search parameter in fire R5. And we can use it when we profile, even though we're profiling R4. Um, and then also uh, the approaching fire I for some guidance on how to deal with barriers and supportive factors. Any questions? Yeah. All right, next slide, please, Karen. So we're currently in process of planning for the May track. Um, May connect to town, we connect to town 30. Um, <clears throat> And um, so right now, we, the plan is to continue our goals discussion, and we need to start focusing on relationships with interventions and outcomes. And we also are looking to coordinate um, goals and relationship with other goals and interventions and outcomes. And uh, I know the PASIO team is looking, now we're getting to the point where we need to integrate with you know, we at Connected on the Connected on tracks need to stop behaving in silos and start to integrate with each other. So, um, Casio have a Connected on planning call that they're having on Fridays, and it should be on the HL7 um, page, conference page, where they're going to start explaining to, to how they can integrate like the Passio tracks, the Gravity track, and the care planning track together. So that you know it's not all so in disjointed and you know behaving in the different silos. And there's a link to the track planning page for May. Um, if anybody have more ideas or want to help out with scenarios, let us know. Any questions? Can is in another slide? Not for connect us on the last slide is the um, balloting timelines. All right. All right. So this um this we copy and pasted by the uh, from the current PSS and then uh, all the items in purple are changes that we're proposing. So. Um, some of the new connect us on uh, dates are included. And then um, the most major thing is we are considering submitting the IG for comment um, during the January 2023 ballot cycle, um, and then pushing out the STU ballot. Uh, uh, so right now it's at September 2022, which isn't feasible. So um, we're proposing pushing that out by a year and updating the subsequent dates. What the time the proposed timeline that we have right now? I don't I don't have any issues with it. I I'm just did I hear why you're wanting to put it out a year? Just the size of it or with I think it was is most is more because the project changed hands, you know. You know what I mean? We just mm -hmm. recently just picked it up and trying to get reacclimated and you know, like where what else had what needs mm -hmm. to be, you know, do we had need more time to do more evaluation and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, we think they, um they, oh go ahead, Gay. No, I was just gonna say then we also had you know, we're, we're hoping to, in it instead, in instead, you know, do the for comment ballot. And I don't know if everyone on the call knows the difference, but for the for comment, we'll kind of get it out there. Hopefully, get some some feedback so that um, you know, any concern, some some concerns, can be addressed in when we do the formal ballot. Um, and the for comment ballot is a little lighter weight in that you don't have to um, necessarily you don't have to address and and all of the comments and um, uh, you, you can just sort of use that for feedback into when you do, do, do your formal ballot. Um, so it's a little, little, little lighter weight and yet 
gives us, will hopefully give us some feedback for um, making the formal ballot even better. One of my yeah. thoughts I, I mean, about I think that's what the... Sorry, I'm uh, sorry, sorry, Roy, go ahead. It's, it's what the four comment, four comment ballot is for. I think it's a good use of the whole purpose of why we have it, so right on. Um, one of my thoughts about this uh, new timeline is that it might be a bit too ambitious uh, for uh, the completion of the SDU reconciliation uh, target date of February 2023. Uh, if I sort of, I, um, uh, is that sort of, oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, so if you are sort of uh, changing the proposed sort of ballot submissions to um, September 2023, then uh, sort of, I, um, shouldn't the complete SDU reconciliation target date be changed as well? Uh, the cascading effect? This would be 2024. Right. And even with that's 2024, I'm still thinking that it's a bit ambitious, uh, sort of uh, given that this uh, sort of ballot closes uh, in uh, September, that leaves you with uh, sort of uh, um, uh, one, two, three, uh, four months at the max, sort of like to do all the ballot reconciliation. Anyway, so yeah, that's- Five months, four. five months, right? No, I mean, uh, I do, I mean, uh, if- uh, Yeah, it should be I mean, it, it depends on the, the extent of the ballot comments, you know. So. Anyway, so that's a sort of yeah. I thought. Yeah, I, I think it's doable depending on the extent of the ballot comments. Okay. I mean, are you saying it's not going to be perfect and the only comment we get, well, this is perfect, this is great? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you know, one of the problems the four comment that's... would help. What's that? I mean, having the, four comment, yes. having the four comment one earlier should help. Yeah, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So you think, okay, so, so if we do do it, if there is, a, if we do do it, uh, September 2023, then we can do the reconciliation by February 2024, is what you're saying? No, 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 no. He's, it doesn't matter. We're, we're, there's, we're not going to take a year to reconcile and publish. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, no. Oh, yeah, no, there is a problem here, though, because right now you've got the black line that says target September 22, proposed changing to September 2023. Yeah. You're, then your reconciliation has to be in 2024. That's oh, right, right. I see what you're talking about. I mean, I see that. That's so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a typo. And, and, <laughs> no, it's just saying and pushing subsequent no. dates down. Right, right, because we, we didn't change that. You know, we're, we're saying we're going to publish it backwards right now. Yeah. Yeah. So we, it's just a typo. We shouldn't, we, we should, it, it should be, you know, February 2023 comes after September. I mean, February 2024 20, comes after September 2023. And so, you know, February 2023 right. comes before September 2023. So we can't possibly do that. But so, yeah, which, those just need to be adjusted. I see what you're saying, Stephen. Those three that say 23 on them would say 24. Yeah. Karen will yeah, so, 25. Karen will fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Gay, that's what I said yep. cascading effect for the two dates. <laughs> <laughs> Or three days. <laughs> Karen, notice this clinicians didn't read the small print that said and pushing subsequent dates down. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I, I didn't make that more clear. I basically um, the linchpin milestone change was the when to submit for SDU ballot. So we didn't um, update all the subsequent dates, but yeah. the, the feedback is noted. Awesome. Well, well we're okay, one minute so over, right? It's not just the 23 dates that change. So essentially the very last line item you're thinking would be 27. Is that how that's gonna work? They might still be able to do it in March. By March yeah, we have to look at so. it. We'll revisit yeah. the day. We'll get them correct yeah. and show it again uh, next time. Yeah. That's because some of the bottom ones that might not need to change. Yeah, I don't think so. I think if you but I don't know, is the STU publication between that and the normative? That's your, you know, what's the required timeline between that? Yeah, I'm not sure. Right to, I'm not sure off the top of my head. 
How many it's times? an SDU Maybe you keep uh, normative. There is a two years kind of time lapse. I think so, but I we we you know I I'm not sure that there's hard and fast rules around it. Um, there's a certain time period. Right. Sure. Yeah. How many times does something have to be go to STU before you can come become normative? <laughs> it depends on it depends on the thing. But the US core is still STU. Mm -hmm. right? CCDA is still STU. So we just have to be on a very long path. I think the only normative well, IG implemented was uh, DS for P, CDA DS for P. The other segmentation for privacy. That's the only one I I think I've seen that we implemented as normative. Everything else has been STU. Is this is this meeting an hour and a half or is it just an hour? No, it's just an hour. We're done. Or we're, we're two minutes over. We do an hour. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you for the very interesting discussion. I just want to steal a couple of minutes just to show um, the. Uh, um, uh, show what I meant by the page that uh, Jay has uh, set up. Uh, okay, that's what I have. Uh, let's go to uh, this page. Uh, and that's the, uh, hang on, is that the page that uh, Jay, you have set up? Yes. So I, uh, oh. I, I actually have to drop. I think Jay already dropped. Okay. But, right. Anyway, right. thank so, you, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Jay. So <laughs> this you. is a page that I think Jay has set up. Uh, so um, I'm uh, asking uh, inputs uh, for uh, um, uh, the various areas of where uh, you might have uh, some uh, um, information that would help us uh, to. Uh, um, uh, understand the functional requirements of your area a lot better, so therefore we can uh, incorporate them uh, into uh, the uh, um, into the uh, care plan dem two dot zero. So if you go to uh, sort of uh, the care plan uh, project under patient care and navigate under care plan dem two dot zero, uh, and you will find uh, this uh, page, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to help us in uh, uh, putting some information in there that uh, would uh, uh, give us a bit more guidance into how to incorporate your requirements and harmonize uh, sort of them into uh, the uh, care plan dem 2.0. And I know that uh, is, I, uh, Becky is still on the call, the nutrition area. If you are able to put something in there, that would be wonderful. I just threw it in, uh, in the chat. Okay. Thank and that's you. the we are we still have to update based upon our ballot comments, but that's right. what we balloted in September. Okay, so what we'll do, I would what we'll do is we'll put the link in there, uh, and then uh, oh, and and then uh, sort of I um, uh, and oh, hang on. Uh, and by the way, for anybody who cares, Fire R five is not balloting in May. I just, oh, is it? I oh. just found out. Um, oh, that's newsy. That's yeah, new. About, yeah. <laughs> Lorraine pinged me about, uh, well, more than 20 minutes ago, but 25 minutes ago and said it's not balloting in May. Oh, okay, right. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> all right, I think that's all what I have uh, um, to uh, share. So uh, hopefully uh, if I, um, you can uh, sort of uh, take a look and uh, sort of put some uh, contents in there to help us, that'll be wonderful. All right, thank you very much. That's all what I have uh, to uh, share. Uh,